I think we're ready to start. Yeah. I, I want to appreciate you wearing a mask. Well, Would you have yeah. them off? Could you so please your appearance? Let's, um, this, we want this conversation to be very informal. And if you can't hear, which is probably my problem, I just have new con context, new hearing aids. And um, if you can speak really clearly, I would appreciate it. And if you see me with my cell phone, it's because I'm trying to turn the volume off. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing with them. Uh, but I, I think I'm getting used to them. They're, they're not, I'm not comfortable with them yet. New companions. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, I'm Shirley Crow. I think you all know that. And this is Patricia Watts. And um, we just want this to be a really casual, uh, fun conversation. We want you to feel comfortable asking questions and uh, just let's try to get a really good conversation going. Uh, and this, this is a part, this conversation is called um, Exploring the Unknown but the, the, the show is called Beneath the Surface, and it's sponsored by the uh, Sci Art Group, the Oakle Group, which is also a, which is a part of the International uh, Art, Science, and Technology. Leonardo. Leonardo. Right, Leonardo. She brings it up. Um, some of you, I think, need to leave right at four, so just you know, feel comfortable doing that. And uh, let's see, what else do we need to mention? Oh, my husband sends his apologies. He has surgery next Wednesday. And we're trying to be really careful. Mm -hmm. And I, I suggested he not come. Mm -hmm. So, whatever. Well, Shirley, we have Jared, wonderful videographer from UNM here with us again. Thank you, Jared. So eventually, this talk will be available. Yes. So we just need to keep track of, of when you know when he's finished his editing, and so that our friends, whether they could be here or not, can take advantage of it. And my uh, Amy here is uh, another and key part of our technology team. So we're very grateful to mm -hmm. them and look forward to. Saving this moment in time. Yeah, it's sure. great. I'm sure people yeah. really like it. Yeah. This is a great size. I just I'm so <laughs> pleased. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so we thought to start out, we go around the room, and if you could introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about yourself, mm -hmm. and then we get the conversation going. Oh my. Okay, I'm Sally Randall, and uh, I love her insistence. She emailed me until I came, ah. and here I am. And oddly <laughs> enough, after all these years, I was apologizing to Susan that I hadn't kept up with her because we met each other 19 years ago. Oh, and she's wow. an amazing yeah. artist. And I am now firmly immersed in the art world. I'm in the process of selling one of Dolly's 66 masterworks. What? Um, <laughs> and I've been working on this for quite quite a while, and uh, we're getting close. I think it'll be shown at Art Basel in Miami Beach, which I went to this last year. And, Is that um, in the fall? Uh, it's the, fall? the first week in December. Oh. And, and I'm also on the advisory board of the Clark Hewlings <coughs> Foundation. And uh, that is the artist who was a realist painter, uh, very big in the 60s. I don't know if you know of his work. His home was here in Santa Fe. He traveled all over the world and painted. And, um, and he left uh, an estate, and his daughter formed a foundation to help educate artists to be self-sustaining entrepreneurs. And I think this group is perfect for some of our programs. We have programs that reached over 54,000 artists last year. And um, Thriving Tuesdays, and um, you have a lot to contribute to the Clark Hewlett's Foundation. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. And I, I have to tell you how I met her. 
<laughs> we had an army party and she and her husband came. And then they had a pajama party. Yes, that's <laughs> right. It was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Are you? The, that's the first, still the first Sunday during the day <laughs> after um, the new year and you bring in a white elephant gift. And mm -hmm. it gets pretty funny. <laughs> so, but seriously, you artists are, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I feel like I had an apartment in New York for 25 years and I couldn't see anything like this mm -hmm. in a space like this. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. Congratulations you. and you'll be hearing a lot more from me. Well, I think it's so wonderful and make sure that there's follow through here because our group, you know, being part of the uh, Leonardo Network, it's like 48 cities all over the globe, and we have easy access to share. So it's a wonderful opportunity that we're just sort of scratching the surface. Wow. And okay. we'd love to connect with you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, we will. Okay. Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to cut it down. <laughs> so much. That's right, not very complicated. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I, uh, I, very briefly, back in uh, 90, 1996, I started a group called the Forum for Science and Art, and my friend here, Ursula, was part of that group. Now, we managed to truck along for 14 years. Then we got connected with the uh, complex, you know, that was here for a while. Uh, so then, um, when that sort of dissolved, after a while I was wandering around saying, where is my people? <laughs> so I, I went to the Santa Fe Institute, mm -hmm. and they hooked me up with Andrea Poli. Lucky me. So we, uh, Andrea and I put our heads together and about three and a half, four years ago, uh, we called a bunch of people together in my studio, and that's where when it began to begin and began to begin. Uh, so Andrea and I are co-coordinators of, of this group, and uh, she—I uh, don't know if many of you know her, but look her up because she's very highly accomplished. Her work is right over here with the video yeah. monitor on the wall. Well, that's it. And 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 not to those two. Uh, at any rate, I'm very, very delighted to be able to work with her. And, uh, we, the pandemic came along as we were just getting, you know, really cooking in. So this is the first time we've shown our work since, you know, two and a half weather pandemic. And we have this space because of vital spaces. Have any, and does anyone know what vital spaces is? It's a nonprofit in Santa Fe that took up the challenge to fill the empty spaces here in the Midtown campus. Oh, we try. Isn't that great? That's great. And Marvin has one of his studios, right, Marvin? So he works with them directly. So I want to thank them too for letting us be here. <coughs> My name is Ursula Freer, and um, for years I did digital art, but somehow I got away from it. But thanks to Susan, I'm here. <laughs> I'm ready to get back into it. See, I know a lot about this girl. <laughs> and I know she's really got it. And uh, Nano, uh, you were very interested in nanotechnology for a while. Am I right about that? That's true. Huh? Yeah. All science. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're happy to have you back. Hi, I'm. Maybe I should take this off. <laughs> I'm Dominique Mazot, and I'm an artist. I call myself a artist. It's a whole story that I just wrote and published in a book called The Heart is Secret. It's part, in a way, part cattle resume, part uh, philosophical ideas based on experience and uh, part memoir to in between. And uh, my work is more into the spiritual. It's uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, 
ritual performances, community projects, and um, and now it's, well not now but installations as is the last form that I worked in. And now that my book is finished, I'm trying to get back to the studio, but I don't know. Yeah, that one. Did you bring the book? No, I didn't. It's in the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but before I forget. I'm not a good promoter. I'm better it's, it's at also promoting other people, but not myself. On the Eco Arts Space website as well. Oh, yeah, it's the available through her, and Patricia's website. Sure. Anyway, I'm glad to be here. I've heard about you through, I think, Patricia oh. and Margaret. Very nice to meet you. Great. I'm Margaret Card. I'm a painter, um, an attorney, and uh, <laughs> lived in Santa Fe almost 35 years, I think. How long have we lived here? Uh, about that. About, about 35 years, 34. Yeah. Um, gosh, I paint all the time. <laughs> what I paint is landscapes, and I'm um, fascinated with what you've done here. It's very nice, and I can't wait to hear about it. Okay. Um, I really sort of short-winded. <laughs> short-winded. Your turn. <laughs> Hi, uh, Morgan Barnard. Uh, I'm a digital artist. I have a studio space here at the um, Vital Spaces Midtown campus. Um, I'm showing some work on the back wall there. Um, I'm a primarily a digital artist um, and I've been sort of um, exploring a lot of print work over the last couple of years, getting back to my roots and drawing and also uh, working with this Lumia uh, light medium that was um, uh, pioneered by Thomas Wilfred in the early 20th century. So I'm kind of going back to what he was experimenting with, with developing sort of new form languages and uh, new visions that are, you know, intertwined inter inter with uh, spirituality, meditative states, things like that. And um, I teach at Highlands University in Las Vegas in the media arts and technology department. And um, yeah, so this, this works a little bit outside of what I normally do. I do <coughs> projection and light in um, installations and public art. <coughs> I'm Jean Ross, I'm a friend of Shirley's and I work with her as her assistant for 10 years, wow. doing a number of different things to help her cause, so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm Karen Michon. Um I first came to Santa Fe in 1964 and I just happened off the highway, I was looking for a place to stay for the night, but it turned out to be um, Indian Market Week, and so I ended up camping <laughs> north of Santa Fe because I couldn't get a place to stay, but I always knew I wanted to come back. I grew up in South America, and there was just this feeling here that I knew I had to come back. So I got back here in 2008. <laughs> Um, I'm an actress. I lived in New York and Los Angeles most of my career, and um, a poet. I, I was just saying um, just a minute ago that one of the things that actors, the art field of acting, has as a drawback is that you can't do it alone. I mean, you can. You can run around your living room rehearsing, but uh, you can't do it alone. So you either need to be in a class or working. And uh, so I found myself observing life around me as is the want of most actors. And I thought, I want, to, I want to record some of this. So about 20 years ago, I started writing poetry, and I've been a poet ever since. And um, I've known Shirley quite a long time through two dogs. <laughs> two dogs? Or two dogs. She's our poodle's godmother. Big dogs. Yes, she, I'm Auntie Kevin. <laughs> yes. And I think Bill Stewart introduced us, didn't he? Yes. yes. I met your mother through Bill Stewart, who right. was a neighbor. Right. And then she told me about you. Right. And I got she told me about you, too. She said, I got someone you got to meet right away. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, hi, I'm Grant Holland, and I'm a friend of Shirley and Ed, and a friend of Susan. Uh, I'm a retired information systems theorist, engineer, all that stuff. I work mostly for Silicon Valley computer companies directly, and uh, the pe period before that for uh, the large scale systems uh, companies that produce those. Um, my first love, however, is my first and second loves, um, besides my wife, of course, are um, uh, mathematics and music. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm academically trained in mathematics, and I spent a hell of a lot of time on music. Right now, I'm developing, as we say in the jazz world, uh, I'm developing the language I need as a player mm -hmm. to do jazz music, and so I'm not very public face facing at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm also, uh, my favorite subject in math is chance and probability, in other words, where the mystery is. I'm dedicated to mystery. I think that's where all the information <laughs> is. is you so I'm picking my for mystery. I'm writing a, a, a book uh, for popular science readers on quantum entanglement. And if I want to write something I don't know anything about, that's perfect. I think I'm particularly good at explaining things once I ever learned them, that learning quantum entanglement is another problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun. So that's, that's what I'm up to these days. Wow. I'm Paul Biaggi. Uh, I have uh, those five paintings there in the center and these three here. And uh, I think, I guess, I have to say that I'm an ADD person. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I, I seem to keep jumping around. I actually started uh, with music as, as a, in a choir. I was a soprano, boys choir. And then from studied piano, and then uh, was in theater in high school. I played a, Irish Leprechaun in Finian's Rainbow. Oh, that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I ended up uh, getting my degree in physics <laughs> and uh, getting, went on for a doctorate. And I started in engineering, but it's too practical and to be too concentrated. So I moved into physics at the University of Colorado, ended up teaching in that area for about 50 years, uh, math and physics some statistics, astronomy, things like that. I was, uh, I, I was actually up at uh, Steamboat Springs in the Colorado Mountain College where I d did all of that. But I didn't have to do chemistry. I've always had problems with chemistry. Mm -hmm. it's, too, it's too exacting, you know. I, <laughs> My husband's a chemist. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm just too... I have problems with it too. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just too sloppy. You know, so, and you know, you can see it in my art. My art's pretty much slopped on. Um, you know, I really like to throw stuff around. And, uh, so I, did, I retired to, well, you know what happened? I, mean, I, should, I don't talk about this, but I started studying dance and also the visual arts when I was in grad school. Because I, was, I did some piano too then, but, but I needed something where I could be around people and uh, music, you know, you would sit in, you would sit in, a, in a rehearsal room at the University of Colorado and you can play by yourself for about eight hours, but I need something a little more social, which I liked about theater, you know, because you, know, you really do form a bond with the people in town. Oh, yes. So I started studying dance and then also I started taking classes in the visual arts and painting and drawing. And, um, but I was studying dance and I walked into this <coughs> studio, which is called the Charlotte, uh, I forget, it's a big studio in, at the University of Colorado. And I realized I really liked dance, I really liked the arts, and I was really drawn very strongly to them. But I was in the midst of, of uh, my thesis, my doctor, not doctoral thesis, which frankly I basically took because I needed the money, I was supporting a family and that sort of thing. So, but, uh, but I was still very interested in physics, just not that aspect. But someone walking into this building and I started, what the hell am I going to do with my life? See, you know, I'm really attracted to the dance, theater, you know, art, 
And here I am doing this thesis. I really am very curious. I love the physics. I love the mystery of it. We all love mystery. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe what I maybe I'm the kind of person that needs to put them together. Maybe I need to put science and art together in some way. And in a way, it's, it would be like putting myself together, my fractured kind of personality. So uh, that's what I began doing, and I. I, uh, I began actually teaching some courses. Uh, I can name these, uh, space, time, art, and science, art, science, and technology, creative and cultural aspects of physics, uh, uh, let's see, uh, human realities, art, science, and literature. <laughs> I mean, it, I usually could find somebody in the humanities to team teach. I also studied humanities at New York University and uh, studied art at the Merrill Institute College of Art. and. Uh, so, you know, that I, I sort of began dedicating myself to, to that, to that kind of uh, integration, trying to see the world as a whole. And, uh, and that was basically, you know, what got me to all of this and got me here. And uh, began teaching a course here, which Susan heard about. She talked me into the Forum for Science, Art and Science, FAS, <laughs> I always called it. And, uh, and you know, basically, you know, that's that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 25 years. So. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm standing behind you. I'll do a quick intro, um, but I'm here because I might need to grab a chair if someone comes in and help organize these. I'm Amy Pilling. I'm an artist and an educator. I have two pieces here: the water piece in the center, and a piece in, in the black box is a slime mold that I'm time lapse doing time-lapse photography. I do uh, art science education at UNM, and I'm very interested in complex systems, complex adaptive systems, biological systems, and alternative intelligence. So that's me. And yeah. <laughs> so you should introduce yourself first. This is your, yeah. Where do I begin? Okay. <laughs> um, I grew up in a little town and, and a thousand people in Missouri. And I, it was a farming community. And I have known since the first grade that art was the only thing I ever wanted to do. And I don't know where it came from. I don't even remember drawing. I remember copying images. But I've written in, in my book that if somebody told me girl that I'd be doing something like this, I probably would have just fainted. <laughs> so that's, that's the mystery of my, the big mystery of my life, I don't understand it. Um, I had um, a rich relative who said he would, he would pay for my, con I grew up very on welfare, very poor, and my mother was not great, no, she wasn't normal. She would go into rages for no reason, but my grandmother was very loving and very supportive. And I had an English teacher who said, you're going to college. And without her, I, I just shuddered to even think what, what, what my life would be like. Um, anyway, back to the, the rich relative, he said, well, you'll get married and have kids. <laughs> and, and so you need to major in home act. <laughs> I lasted one semester. <laughs> I had never <coughs> taken an art course. I remember I cleaned the superintendent's office and we became sort of buddies. And, and I'm like, can't you just have an art class? And he said, no, you know, we're lucky to even have English. Uh, so anyway, I, would, I enrolled late because this rich relative wanted me to go to a, a Methodist College at the University of Missouri. Thank heavens. And I would go by the art department and just, I mean, I, it was seduction. I mean, I just could not resist it. And my rich relative said, you shouldn't take art classes because you'll see nudes. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. I absolutely loved figure drawing. I would get so excited. Sometimes I couldn't draw. I remember my teacher saying, just try to meditate. 
beforehand. Uh, and then uh, I met my husband on a blind date. After, I see, I've been at the university about a year. This June the 3rd, we'll be, we'll be married 60 years. Oh my goodness. Which, it, it hasn't been perfect, but it's been pretty happy. <laughs> and, uh, that makes it perfect. What? Yeah. That makes it perfect. <laughs> yeah. Pretty uh, happy. And, and I've gone through a lot of stages <laughs> with my work. I brought the, the book mm -hmm. that Patricia helped me write. It's, you can kind of thumb through it and see some of the stages that, uh, that I went through. I, uh, we lived in Delaware. He worked, I'm sorry, my husband worked for DuPont. He was an executive, a chemist. And uh, things were going really well there. And then I got really severe back pain. I spent years doing very little art. I would get relief if I lay down but I could barely function. And, um, well, before that, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here. Before that, I showed a lot at the State Arts Council. Really loved that. They were really supportive. And then we decided that we were gonna move to Santa Fe, and I started getting better. <laughs> so we don't eat here. I'm just doing I, I, think part of it, I think part of it was psychological perhaps dealing with a lot of my background, which wasn't so happy as a child. Uh, and that's when I started getting interested in, in science. And we have a, a, an area I call the lookout, which is above our house. You can go up there, and you just, I do, I just feel so a part of the universe. So, especially in the evening when the stars are out, I mean, it's just, it's really magic. And that's the stage, I mean, that, these two are in that stage. Um, uh, I just, I'm in love with the mystery of, of existence, of what, what it's all about. You know, why are we here? And I want to do paintings that are beautiful and powerful and tell the truth. And I don't want them to just be super pleasant, you know, but, but tell the truth. And then one of the reasons I'm doing this is I want to inspire other people to find their way, to find what works for them. And I just joined this group because I am, because of my current interest in science. And I thought, well, it's going to be fun to see if I if, it, if it's for me. So that's sort of where I am. That's a really short version. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wait, that's okay. I mean, we all look at, and you'll, you'll reference other parts of your life, I think, through the questions that we, in our conversation. So this is, um, this is, I am Patricia Watts. I'm the founder of Eco Art Space, which, um, I, a concept I came up with in 1997. Um, I envisioned a place where artists and scientists and families would attend this place and learn about the principles of ecology through, um, you know, immersive environments created by artists. And so I, I envisioned it at a, near a water body. I didn't know where that was going to be. I mean, I really had this whole vision of it. And uh, I put a website up, I think in 97, 98, to actually won an award for it through Earthlink. <laughs> and, um, and then I started noticing some people copied my website and it just took all my information off of it. <laughs> like that was happening early. And uh, yeah, that happened. I don't talk about that much, but anyway. <laughs> and that person then got a lot of credit for it because they were a guy. <laughs> Looking back in my life, I see a lot of that, you know, didn't think much of it at the time, but I just was like, am I invisible? <laughs> you know, like, can you see me? Um, but, so I persevered in my curating, I'm an art curator of art and ecology, working with artists addressing environmental issues. Um, I created a nonprofit platform uh, to curate these shows at different institutions. I have an East Coast partner, Amy Lipton, in New York. Um, she passed away in December of 2020, right after I came up with the idea to make it into a membership platform. 
So my membership is a little over, it's almost 900 members right now. <clears throat> and 100, over 150 are from 26 other countries. Oh, wow. And I'm based here on Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the name of your uh, Eco Art Space. Eco Art Space. Yeah. So here's our 2020 catalog. It was a show juried by Eleanor Hartney, who's an art critic in New York. Mm -hmm. You can pass that around. And I just brought some other Richard Bowman. I, I have published oh, 12. 13 books now, a lot since 20, 2014. I started on this path of being my own publisher. Um, this is Watts Art Publications, which is WAP, which is, which is what you see here, WAP. Um, but Richard is from the Bay Area. So I was in the Bay Area when I came up with this idea to start publishing books. It's kind of um, complementary to what I do with Eco Art Space as a curator. I wanted to start writing for her because a lot of times curators work for museums and they're doing a lot of administrative work and they don't get to actually write about the artist or the shows that they're curating. And that was the other thing with Eco Art Space is I would, since I have this background in publishing, I thought, well, you know, it'd be great even if a show is online that they have a book, you know, that the artists have a book. And so that eco consciousness and then Embodied Forest was from last year. This is 90 of our members who are all addressing forest ecology. Wow. And so about, I think 17 of them are from other countries in that one. So although about those two shows were not in person, um, the books are online, they're interactive, there's videos in the exhibition that you can click on the videos and open them up. It's a, a platform called Issue, ISSU, so all my books are on Issue. Um, but yeah, when I, I got here, my son graduated from St. John's College in 2019, and I've been traveling through Santa Fe for many years. I curated a show at the Santa Fe Art Institute in 2013 um, called uh, Shifting Baselines. And it had two artists that I actually was in residence with who were uh, doing art science work, and so I got to watch them create their work. You know, live with them for 30 days before the show opened. Uh, that was something that I had proposed to SFAI. They've never done that. Like, let a curator be in residence with the artist. And, you know, curators can look at work and we can make a lot of assumptions. Of course, we can interview artists and get as much detail as we can. And then we write about the work and we might bring to it, um, you know, some perspectives that maybe the artists themselves don't, you know, see uh, in the road, you know, the, in how they do their work. But, uh, so anyway, I wrote an essay for Shirley. I was happy when I got to, when my son graduated and he left, I'm like, okay, well, I'm moving here. <laughs> uh, he's gone, I'll, I'll move here now. And um, yeah, Shirley was one of the first people um, that I met. I went to an art science, um, yeah, an art science lecture. Lecture, where were we? Up in uh, Atlanta, or Los Alamos. At Los Alamos. It was like November 2020, no, 2019, it was before the pandemic, and that's where I met you, Susan. So, um, so we kept a conversation. My family's from Missouri. I could completely relate with a lot of what uh, Shirley would talk about. You know, my, I come from a farming family, you know, lots of country hillbillies <laughs> from Scotland and Ireland and England and, you know, you know, the, all, the, all that goes with that. So we had, you know, that in common. And, but I just really loved her paintings and I had to tell her for a year that when I tell you that I love your paintings, I'm not just saying that. Because <laughs> I don't just say that to anybody. You know, like if I don't like your work, I just won't say anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping that something will be said about these two. Yes, things. yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this painting here was in the Eco Consciousness catalog, which you have there. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know that was picked, selected by Eleanor Hartman. That you know wasn't my selection, but um, and I wanted to note that in the invitation for today's uh, talk, that this painting is featured, but it's the wrong title. Ah. Yeah. Oh. And you'll see it in the book, it's Into the Infinite. I, I don't remember all the titles. 
<laughs> that, that's always fun for me too as a curator room. Like, well, what's the title? I don't know. What year was it made? I don't know. <laughs> it's like, you just do your work and we'll figure this out somehow. Please sign your pieces and date them. <laughs> oh, for me. Okay. Um, I spent the pandemic organizing. She's actually very organized. All of my work from the early 70s. Yeah, but she not every painting. And that is here. important. And it was really kind of fun. I never thought I would like it, but excuse me. Keep your job. Curators. You're archiving, yeah. Right. I mean, curators, uh, museums are going to be more attracted to an estate, a collection that is organized. And I do estate work, so I know how to do you that. Do you have courses on organizing your art? I don't give classes, but I. Yeah. Actually, Clark Hewlings has courses online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, I good. 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 And there's foundations like out of New York. The, um, the, it's a, the, the painter, the female painter that they have a great uh, legacy program, and they, they have a, a PDF download. And I can give you that link. on yeah. archive it. In, in Tasmania, uh, David Swartz spent fifty million dollars blasting out a granite cliff to build his personal museum. Oh, great. He's a savant uh, that is barred from every casino in the world because he could keep five decks of cards in his head. Mm. And so he now has online gambling. And oh. that's, what he, that's how he makes his money. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's the um, Museum of Old and New Art in mm. Tasmania. His personal museum. I think his name is Doc David Swartz. David Swartz, I think, is his name. Swartz. I'm pretty sure that's his name. But I've well, been let's, to the let's with Charlie's work here right now. Um, and he won't allow titles. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of anti title. I just opened a show in New York. We have um, an eco art space exhibition with 40, no, 54 artists. And uh, they were very frustrated that there were no labels put up immediately. And I was like, well, can we just see what it's like to not have labels for a little bit? Because, you know, some people definitely have to read a label before they can even take in the work. <laughs> it's, it's, I think people's brains are just wired differently. And, um, you know, I did create a checklist for that show and put it in order. You know, I numbered them on the sheet, but you had to be able to know where to start. There weren't numbers on the walls. So yeah, how spatially, how we orient ourselves when we look at work and how we move around the room is always very interesting. I have a, a master's in exhibit design, uh, museum studies, so how a show is hung and the juxtapositions and how you create flow and all that is always of interest to me. Um, but what I wanted to talk about with Shirley's work and how it relates to science is um, Curiosity, imagination, and intuition. You know, Shirley is not coming to uh, this group as a scientist at all, and doesn't want but, you know, to be the expert. Right? My son is a PhD geologist. My daughter-in-law is, is an environmental PhD geologist, and my husband is a PhD chemist. So I uh, must have absorbed a little bit of it. <laughs> Osmosis. <laughs> Osmosis. <laughs> but I loved, I loved geology and botany, which I took in college. But with your paintings, you're not trying to uh, illustrate. You know, you're not coming from it to depict something real in the real world, right? Right. It's all coming from in inside you somewhere, yes. and that's what I found intriguing about um, her work. Is she's really operating from intuition and how you access that. And I think that's kind of the gift that a lot of scientists wish that they had. Because the people, the, art, the scientists who have made some of the biggest leaps in science have been the ones who can, you know, tap that. And, I can give you some tips on that. Yeah, she can give you tips for sure. Because <laughs> I think it's, yeah, I don't know if there was like a, maybe Chick Sent Me High, the author of Flow could probably there's probably a chapter on accessing intuition in his books. I, I can't remember that right now. Um, but yeah, that's something that artists are good at. And um, 
you know, I'm definitely interested as a curator in an art and ecology of where the overlap is between intuition and the science. Because sometimes I think, you know, what she's saying is through osmosis, she's been around a lot of PhDs who have a lot of knowledge that they're obviously talking about around her. And, and that is Not getting that much. <laughs> it's getting into your subconscious, whether you understand it conceptually or not, and you are kind of um, accessing that information somehow when you paint. And um, it's a big mystery to me, the whole thing is. I'm working on a triptych now. And it, it starts with just a vague idea. <laughs> I, I think I want to do a landscape. And um, I sort of rough it out. Just, it, it's like somebody else is doing it. And it's, it's about, I think this is really important for me at least, is I've learned to be very submissive and just let it happen. And I go into the studio and it says, okay, we're ready today. We're going to lay out, you know, we'll draw what's going to be roughly, you know, like the, the painting I'm working on now is the landscape at the bottom and then these, it's inspired by fire and there, these flames are coming up and then, and then down, and then above are streamers of linear, linear shapes. And I, I don't know why. I don't know why I wanted them there, but I really like them. It, it's, it's very mysterious, but I, I've learned through the years, I can't just go in and say, today I'm going to go do this incredible painting, and I'm going to, you know, put red here and do that and forget it. it, it it's like, I'm okay, well now I think I want to do the landscape here. And now I wanted to work the, you know, the streamers hanging down. And now it's taking a break. It's not telling me anything, and that's okay. And I think probably the reason is is because I'm worried about my husband. He's going to have major surgery Wednesday, and I just wanted to learn. I want to go weed and you know do simple things. But in general, like. So I'll have some ideas sort of in my head, like we have a bevel mirror and there are beautiful rainbow shapes, colors that come around the edge of it too. And I've been interested in that for a long time and I don't know where it will lead. I'm thinking maybe those rainbow shapes would be fun in this landscape, but when I try it, it doesn't want, it doesn't want those. Mm -hmm. um, and another, I, I just spent a wonderful time in bed we have a one-story house, and our bedroom's on the second floor, and the sun comes in at a certain time of day. If I'm a real sleepy head, uh, I, I get to see this incredible light shining down on these sheets. And the sheets have all different shapes, and the sheets are kind of a warm red, and the walls are a cool red. And as the light changes, they become all different variations. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of rolling around in my head. I did a photograph of it, but it doesn't say, you know, I want to make a painting. But then maybe eventually <coughs> something will happen. But I think it's about being open. That's really important. But you're, we're, we're in a magical place, too. I mean, to what you see. And that's something that we come to understand oh, about. Yeah. Something that we've come to understand about Shirley's work is it taps into the transcendental painters. That we're also tapping into what you were tapping into, and there is an energy in the landscape here. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the elevation and the light and the mm -hmm. humidity. All the elements that are here create those um, perceptions that you have around you. Um, yeah, I think my life experiences have affected my work. Yeah, you said your influence are the landscape of New Mexico, the right. elements, and the, the culture here, which I'm assuming is the Pueblo influence, because you do have, uh, some, of, some of our paintings have figures in them, you'll see, you know, they have kind of a southwest, um, 
I had, a, I had a show at the state, state I, I, this is interesting, I think that your art can lead you without you realizing it. Like I had a show at the State Arts Council and then there was this curator came and we walked around together. We hadn't moved to Santa Fe and he said, these are all Santa Fe colors, they're all Southwestern. <laughs> and I didn't even realize it. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, in, in a way, it took me a while to realize that I was really It's your palace. Yeah. yeah. My, and I remember a friend was in my studio and she said, you're painting energy. And I'm like, you're right. You know, I didn't really realize it. But that's, it's just such a joy to be led by this mysterious, I don't know what the word is, power, energy. energy yes. But one point I want to make is you don't have to be an artist. Your life can be like art, you know? You, you, if you're open, some strange things can happen and they can lead to something that you never even thought would have any importance or whatever. When, when, when you had that, go oh. Well, on your close to the subject, it's important to me. <clears throat> I, I say that I am um, my body, mind, spirit is animated and orchestrated by the creative life force of nature. Creative life force of nature, really, I've tried a lot of different ones. Right now, that's my favorite. <laughs> so I can look out at a big tree, you know, oh, we're in the same energy, mm -hmm. the life force of nature. Mm -hmm. That feels good for me, so they're nice. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we have to find what's good for us. Yeah, sure. I find often I'll go to an exhibit and it's a completely different style than, than I'm interested in, but it gives me the urge to go home and do my own. You say you're open. Is that when you're sitting with your, you're right in front of your can, your canvas, or you know your, your support, whatever it is? Is that when the openness occurs and you say, "Oh, let me try this"? Or no, I'm open. I, I I'm not open all the time. But but I mean, I try to be open. I'm open here. You know, there's a good chance I'll learn something yeah. from you that I didn't know before, or I'll just have a bit of motion in it or whatever. Yeah, I want to be open to experiences all the time, as much as possible. And then they sort of filter through you onto your art, or? I guess so. And it's, I just wondered. Like I said before, it's, it's like something from another existence Maybe comes well. and says, okay, today, I mean, it doesn't literally say the words to me, but today, this is what we're going to do. Mm. And I mean, it sounds like to me like flow. Do you, have you, you've read it, yeah? yeah. Chick said me hi, the Russian, he just died uh, this year, I think, or yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, you, she's not read his books either, but <laughs> it sounds like that's what it is. Because you are you can't really come up with something that's n not in your brain, right? Or not part of your experience. It comes from somewhere, but how, where you stash it and how you access it and how you allow it to take form is up to you. Like if you want to illustrate it, you know, like is it in print on your mind where you're never going to forget it? Or does it just go somewhere and then you access it through yeah, just re relaxation, meditation. So we all have different ways of accessing the things that we kind of pull together through our experiences. I want to, uh, I, when I'm in the studio, I'm, I'm alert. I, I'm like, I'm ready to go. But I'm also relaxed at the same time. I think that's a state. Mm. That is, it takes practice yeah. mm. to get to that point. I taught creativity workshops in my studio, and it was a lot of fun. I had people who had never done any art, and I wanted to just give them a taste of the joy of creating, of just playing. And I bet 90% of them would come in and say, I'm not creating, you know. And it was so much fun to show them that they could be creative. And if I tell them, Okay, 
just pretend you're a kid at a sandbox. And you could just stand, like, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and I think maybe that's a part of, of, of this openness, is just, you know, here I am, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but you know, I'm enjoying seeing you, and what will I learn? And it's just kind of having fun, too. It's, it's four o'clock, I think there was somebody who had to leave then. I'm just going to say a quote real quick. I don't know when you stop recording, but uh, it is a quote by Einstein. I wish I had a female equivalent that I can quote. I'm going to dig one up one day. Uh, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all that we know and understand. Well, imagination embraces the entire world and all there will ever be to know and understand. Really good. Yeah, so imagination and intuition are the springboards uh, are the springboard scientific progress depends on. But uh, when evidence refutes a hypothesis or a feeling, that's the end of the line. Yeah, so it has to be replicable, you know, in science. So scientists often I think envy artists because they have freedom. And, and artists and be scientists because they have knowledge that you know they're hungry for. I find working with artists who work with scientists, they're always enamored with the scientist because they just want to suck up all that knowledge, you know, and do something with it that, with their skill set. But often I find the scientists will uh, be a little ambivalent because it's outside their comfort zone, and oftentimes they. You know, if it's not, yeah, replicable or all the things that they've been taught, then it would mean that they're, you know, not professional or, you know, Well, so science has a lot more constraints. A lot of times, I think, you know, I, I did a course in space time or in science, and Cezanne, for instance, he really anticipated Einstein's curve space time. But see, the, he cut, and a lot of times the artists huh. will have these notions before this, you know, but, but and, because the scientists might have them too, but they're still constrained by the knowledge that they have and also any incoming knowledge. So the artist is a lot freer that way. And then, of course, so they show up with a lot of these things before the scientist does. Yeah, I've, I've experienced that as yeah. well, yeah. with artists introducing uh, concepts that then they can build on. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Before Crick and Watson, discovered the helix of the DNA, Dolly had painted it years oh. before. Cool, what painting? And um, in um, one of his paintings, it's at the, in the um, uh, museum in um, St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. Florida. Nice. And, but he, and, and Bernard is a cousin of Watson, so he was at his desk and, and where he had the helix uh, DNA. And, and he told the story that, no, Dolly, Dolly painted it before he discovered it. He just recognized it in it, yeah, interesting. And he also had the, the, the painting of stepping on the, the, it's Columbus, but he's not stepping on the land, the, the ships are behind, he's stepping on the moon, and that was his uh, prediction that man would oh, step right. on the moon. Yeah, yeah. Twenty years before he stepped on the moon, right, right. <laughs> you know. Before, well, I think it's important to invite scientists to see your shows when you're as an artist, because they'll see things that you're not going to see, and just like get their impressions. You know, very important. Yeah. Go ahead. So I'd like to get back to the question that you were describing uh, when you last talked. When you were talking about the children coming into your classroom, and you're trying to impart to them, share with them what state of being they need to get into in order to do, be doing art. And I've given that some thought as we all have. And I have an analogy that I think kind of approaches it pretty well, which is you don't want to be too stiff because then you can't get the vibration, but you don't want to be too slack because you can't get it either. You have to be in a mental state like a medium. A medium. A medium is how to find a medium is a, a, a condition that can carry waves. It, it can pick up waves, it can carry them, and it can change them, and it can express them outward. And that's what meditation is all about. Meditation is all about getting to that middle state 
or you're listening, but you're actively listening so that you can receive the waves around you and then carry them and well, transform them you. as they exp express out. I, I meditate every morning. Like I have a bongo and they get my tea and I try different forms of medicate, meditation. Recently I've been doing like I breathe in for one and then count for two, three, and four. I really like that one. But I've done body scans and all kinds of it. But I think the state that I get in when I'm doing the work is a little different than that. It's it's you're very alert, but you're also very relaxed at the same time. I think that's and relaxed that's, attention. That's, that's, it's it's okay. Okay. that's yeah. Yeah. relaxation. Relax. I think that no, 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 asleep. no, 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 to, to take on the vibrations around you and vibrate them as a medium. Yeah. Yeah. I think in well, hypnosis, maybe we should start on what time it is. But thank you again. It was such fun. And I hope you're inspired. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. We'll, we'll stay a little longer to yeah. yeah. ask questions, yeah. but if you have to go, it would be a good this is your chance. <laughs> good to see you, Tony. See you again. Good to see you. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Bye. Bye.